Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today's video is a comparison between two of the greatest ancient powers of the Mediterranean during classical antiquity, Greece and Rome, with a stronger focus on military culture and period technology. Hopefully this research provides useful and insightful information not only about the cultural differences between these two powers, but also about those methodological aspects concerning innovation, implementation of war technology and pathways of innovation diffusion, which may be difficult to operationalize and measure. To begin to speak about the structure of classical war, we need to first understand and discuss some antecedent factors that laid the foundation for these two warlike cultures to form. Historiography provides an excellent pathway to begin our analysis, but due to the limitations of this field as an information system, we will also approach this matter through a cross-cultural deep examination, which in this case comprises the behavioural patterns of certain societies towards their attitude to war. The military model that emerges during the Greek Dark Ages, which solidifies itself during the Greece of the Classical Age, between the end of the 8th century and the beginning of the 7th century BC, is very different from what we imagine from the tales of the heroes of the Mycenaean world. Emerging from a belligerent and chaotic period, the Greek world generally doesn't seem to have a particular fascination for war. It in fact analyzes it in a pragmatic manner, identifying it as the onerous duty of the citizen, a need. While in the Italic, Celtic and Germanic worlds we see a glorification of the warrior and the death in battle. Conversely, in Greek literary production there is space for a deeper and even more realistic commentary. Ironic at times, dramatic more often than not. Tertius writes about men who bite their lips and rub the heels of their feet to try and release their fear. Xenophon and Plutarch describe in details the terror that possesses the soldiers right before battle. I find this description noteworthy and I'd like to focus on it for a brief moment. These nonverbal cues are highly indicative of the Greek soldier's mental state here. Actions such as fidgeting, engaging in lip compression movements are all signs of self-soothing behaviour due to a markedly heightened anxious state or stress. In other words, the so-called fight or flight response which can lead to involuntary movements and dryness of the mouth. The heel rubbing is also a form of anxiety display due to the huge cognitive load the individuals were under. To me, this is a beautifully realistic description because it's true to the human nature of war, which as you can see, hasn't changed. Humans are humans, whether they be ancient or modern. And in this case, body language speaks more than words, because words can be controlled, articulated and crafted. We can also see proof of that by opening a brief window into ancient religious understanding of the classical period. For instance, look at the Greek god Ares in classical Attic pronunciation, who is significantly different to its Roman counterpart, Mars. He is the embodiment of war and massacre. It's not a coincidence that both his sons are fear and terror. Greek war culture, if we exclude the peculiar case of Sparta for a moment, does not derive from a warrior aristocracy, but from small landowners whose relationship with conflict is not necessarily exalted nor sacred per se. The Greek man confines war within rules, structures it in order to reduce its impact on the numerical loss of human life. It is also due to this aspect that the Greek mind invents aftotosistima lerotan phalanga, the phalanx of hope lights. In a way, this is a characteristic that defines the system. The hope light phalanx is defined by the ultra-tight formation functionality, characterized by heavy infantry armored with helmet, cuirass, greaves and shield. And here is a little token of respect for my Greek subscribers. Ioplites itan varia thorakis meni ke porusan halkina krani thorakes ke periknimides, sto aristero heri kratusan mia spida. The main weapon of a hoplite is a dori, which is a spear, generally speaking between 2 to 2.5 meters in length, and a dimetro dori, which would effectively keep the enemy at bay, allowing the soldier to wound the opponent while being at a distance. In order to fight effectively in such a packed formation, an individual hoplite doesn't need to exceed or be particularly skilled in single combat, as the very structure of the phalanx severely frustrates individually skilled combatants. On the contrary, in order to function properly, the phalanx needs two things cohesion and coordination. The skill to operate in unison is paramount, individual skills is only secondary. Moreover, the phalanx is strongly connected to the terrain it is deployed on, which is why Greek phalanx battles were usually planned in specific geographic locations with open fields that would allow maneuvering. 
The warriors will be deployed in ranks, usually with a depth of eight lines, and will begin to advance towards each other, led by the sound of the auloi, a wind instrument in ancient Greece often described as double flutes, trying to maintain their formation as intact as possible. Furthermore, the sources tell us that at a distance of approximately 200 meters, the charge would occur, called epidromos. This is when the dori, which up to this point was carried vertically, will be deployed and engaged, and the shield, which was carried to the side, will be placed in the front, slightly slanted, in order to allow full leg range of motion. During this charge, the formation was known to oscillate, fragmenting slightly the lines. We are in fact told that only the Spartans were so well disciplined that they could delay the attack or charge until the last 10 meters or so, as to not compromise formation cohesion. Now, whether or not this infantry charge actually happened has been the debate between scholars and historians and military enthusiasts for the last 20 years. We'll get back to it, but for now, let's talk Rome. Differently from the Greek world, in Western Rome we don't have an analogous process of events and conditions which would result in the natural birth and development of the hoplite phalanx. We know that since the very beginning, warrior aristocracy had a significant, if not pivotal, role within Roman society, and we'll have to understand it in order to fully comprehend the sphere of cultural warfare. But before we do that, please allow me a little diversion. Before I explode. Every time I say the word Italy on a video where I talk about ancient Rome or the classical period, I get keyboard warriors that tell me, ha, you shouldn't use the word Italy, it's a modern word, or Italy didn't exist, you don't even know that. The Latin word Italia, which is used hundreds of times throughout the classics, is absolutely not a modern word. The original meaning of the word Italia was initially used to refer to the specific region of modern-day Calabria, approximately. The meaning widens to central and southern Italy, and eventually, in 42 BC, it has become the official word to represent the entirety of the Italian peninsula. And while I'm at it, to the people that tell me that I'm Sicilian, therefore I'm not Italian, I'd like to say this. Under Emperor Diocletianus, both Sicily and Sardinia became official administrative parts of Italia. Thus, Sicily has been part of Italy for 1,800 years and the word Italia is older than the Colosseum. Back to the Romans. We could say that perhaps one of the greatest differences in terms of war culture between the Greeks and the Romans is the fact that the Romans had a natural attitude towards research and development always looking for more sophisticated instruments of war, with the aim of maximizing enemy losses during any given encounter. While the Greeks favor a form of hand-to-hand -hand combat at the expenses of ranged warfare, in Italy the very opposite occurs, as we witness the development of several types of javelin, the most famous of which was the pilum. As most of you know, the main purpose of the pila is to wound the enemy through their shield, and in some tactical application there is also the possibility of trying to render the opponent's shield useless after impact. This kind of heavy javelin was most likely invented and built by several populations, the Sabellians, the Gauls, the Etruscans, but it is the latter that will introduce the first specimen, which are quickly adopted by all the populations that came in contact with the Etruscan sphere of influence. This fundamental tendency that the Romans had towards innovation, which is one of the innate characteristics of Roman warfare, will be one of the main reasons why the Romans will eventually prevail. Strategic decision-making about contemporary technology, future technology implementation within a Roman world will now be addressed. The Roman philosophical approach was to always be looking at cultural differences between your civilization and your enemies as an opportunity to adapt and improve. This explains how individual, social, cultural and organizational factors affected the phenomenon of constant development of arms, investment in technology, new strategies, tactics, equipment and organization within the Roman army. In a way, the study of diffusion of innovation allows us to formally evaluate technology acceptance behavior on which ancient technology acceptance models did rely, within the military sphere through the cultural dimension. The innovation and implementation stage, which is more than apparent among Roman generals, consuls and high-ranking strategists, was based on the following steps. Assessing the innovation complexity, ease of use and learning curves, and then counterbalance them with the possible gains or relative advantage prospects on the field of battle. For the Romans everything is practical, tech needs to be applicable, 
the Roman army training program is the test subject, the field of battle, the ultimate baptism of fire. Such tests will have a decisive effect on either confirming or rejecting implementation decision and large-scale resource investment towards mass production. What doesn't work is rejected, what works is accepted, and a newly acquired technology is then reworked, redesigned, manipulated and adapted to the individual needs of a legion, of a campaign, of the empire. Their approach, when closely inspected, is in fact rather modern and scientific. As one would expect, initially the Greek colonization of Sicily and southern Italian territories with the subsequent contact with Rome will result in a partial adoption of the Greek phalanx in Italy. But rather than being a core element of Italic forces, it becomes more of a distinguishing factor of status. The Greek phalanx is, however, interpreted according to local habits and customs, so when you look at early Roman but also Etruscan hoplites, one of the main striking differences is the fact that they were always carrying javelins with them. But eventually the phalanx will be abandoned, not only because of the need for a much more dynamic force due to the enemies Rome had to face at the time, but also due to the geographic natural characteristic of the Italian peninsula, which didn't suit phalanx style combat. This is when the Roman army returns to its origins and the original Hastatus, or the Roman spearman, becomes a swordsman, but maintains its name. Which is why sometimes it can be a little confusing when you're like, but these are swordsmen, why are they called Hastati? Well, now you know why. And finally, only the Triari, the veterans, will maintain the spear, at least until the Marian reforms. As the legions continue to evolve, the Romans adopt a type of shield called Tyreos. Now, when we look at the Etruscan versions, some will be flat, some will be curved, but the Romans mostly adopt the curved type. And as it continues to curve and change in development, it will become what we normally refer to as the Scutum. And this is when the Roman approach to war evolves to what is called shock and charge, where the Romans would initially throw their javelins at the enemy, this is the shock part of the attack, and then they would charge in, seeking hand-to-hand -hand combat, sword at hand. So the Roman legion, when compared to the hoplitic Greek armies, are much more flexible and dynamic, as the soldiers are able to both close into tight shield wall formations or spread out and operate singularly. In fact, we are even told by Polybius that the Roman legionary needs a space of three Roman feet all around him. That's about 90 centimeters, both on each side and from the soldier in the back. Returning briefly to that concept of the hoplite formation and how they would charge into the enemy, even though we're talking infantry, I'd like to point out that the following description, which is based on the sources, has been highly debated for the last 20 years. Still, there might be at least a certain level of truth or veracity to it, so I think it's still worth exploring when it comes to 8th or 7th century BC warfare. Based on his experiment, Hansen calculated that when the hoplites decided to charge, they would reach a speed of approximately 8 kilometers per hour. Then the so-called clash of spears would ensue, which is where the first dead would occur. We are then told that some of the spears would break, hence the fighters would switch to daggers, swords, and when it comes to the Spartan sword, which was usually shorter, it was most likely preferred because once you fight with a very large shield, a sword that is a little shorter is usually more effective when it comes to stabbing and trying to find a hole in the enemy's formation. After the impact, the phalanx would regain solidity and the push phase would begin. Helped by the strength of the fellow soldiers behind them, the hoplites would begin to strike against the enemy, possibly both with overarm and underarm blows, considering vast paintings, while trying to compromise the enemy's formation. We are also told that in order to defend their right side, which was the weaker side, the soldiers would tend to tilt slightly, therefore possibly deviating offline. Whether we should consider this a realistic representation or not, I surely strongly oppose the idea that some scholars brought forth of a completely ritualized war in ancient Greece, since it's quite clear from the sources that people actually died. And talking about those casualties, Peter Krenz on his book analyzes and calculates possible death rates during these encounters in hoplite warfare. Let's have a look. We are told that rarely the defeated army lost more than 20% of its regulars and on average the number of dead would gravitate towards a 14% for the losing side, while the victor would draw their losses between a mortality rate of 10% at worst and a more conservative 5% in best case scenarios. These numbers are in fact interesting when looking in context with a full consideration of how, in fact, hoplite warfare was not only an effective medium of war, but it was also a way to reduce the impact of said war in society without penalizing the productive output of the police. The 
utility of cross-locality and cross-cultural comparison stems from the perception of any given foreign culture through the documented sources, and according to those sources, both in Italy and in general from the Romans, the Greek culture was perceived as superior. Protracted contact, beginning already in the Mycenaean period until the colonization of Sicily and the southern Italian territories, exposed the Romans to the myth and legends of the Greeks, which were locally assimilated and mixed with indigenous beliefs. See my video on the difference between Roman gods and Greek gods, link in the description below. Greece was the original land of heroes, marked by glorious deeds, and this was amplified by the deeds of Alexander the Great. Therefore, from a purely materialistic standpoint, during the first encounter between the Greeks and any of the many Italic populations of the time, the Greeks must have looked richer, more sophisticated, very well equipped, since they belonged to a more complex and economically stronger society. One could even postulate that the way these two powers evolved was a case of reciprocal determinism. Reciprocal determinism is the idea that behaviour is controlled or determined by the individual through cognitive processes and by the environment through external social stimulus events. In simpler terms, Rome will be fascinated by Greeks not only for an extended period of time, but on a multitude of levels. Let's have a look. Symbolic, Alexander the Great became canon. Linguistic, in Republican Rome, Greek was the language of the educated. See Quintus Fabius Pictor. Cultural, rich Romans obtain Greek slaves for their children and even non-Greek slaves are forced to receive a Greek name, so you could pretend to have a Greek sophisticated slave. Artistic, with Greek art and taste being constantly imitated in Rome. There is a famous passage by Horatius which I believe illustrates this adversarial admiration wonderfully. Graecia capta ferum victorem capit. The conquered Greece conquered the savage victor. Now one thing that I must clarify very briefly is, even though on this video I've been focusing exclusively on how Roman warfare was constantly developing, evolving and adapting new technology, it is important to underline the fact that Greek warfare also evolved through the centuries. They just didn't evolve at the same rate, but a certain level of change reforms and adaptation did happen also in hopolitic warfare. And two excellent further reads on this are both Diodorus Siculus and Cornelius Nepos. For reasons of time, considering this video is already quite long, we can't really go into the depth of how Greek warfare evolved throughout the ages, but one thing I can tell you very quickly is the fact that the armour becomes lighter, new linen-based types of armour are introduced, the shields become smaller with the introduction of Pelta, and this reduction on the overall defensive aspect of hopolitic warfare is counterbalanced with the increased length of the spears, moving from Dori to Sarissa. And we go from hoplites to peltasts to Macedonian phalanx. It's difficult to fully decide on one specific date to talk about the beginning of the clash between Rome and Greece. If we are talking about Greek colonies already, then the struggle against the Syracusans maybe could be a beginning. Definitely, when focusing entirely on military history and those conditions, and when we put the highly dynamic and adaptable Manipula Legion warfare versus the monolith of Hellenic or Politic warfare, we already see that a shock and charge tactic tends to prevail against phalanx formations. After the Romans defeat Hannibal and begin to face the phalanx in combat, there is a sort of reverential fear when the legionaries see the arrival of Philip V Macedonian's phalanx formations. However, when facing the Romans, the terrain is often not favourable. These are not the vast valleys or grasslands of Thracia. At this time, both Roman legions and phalanx use specialist corps, usually recruited on an ethnic base, whether it be archers, slingers, light cavalry wings. But whether for the Romans, these corps are just an add-on, and their function is complementary within a very solid infantry corps, which can also shower you with javelins. For a phalanx-operated army, the perfect integration of both wings of cavalry and ranged troops is necessary for the phalanx to be able to function. One of these corps fails, and the phalanx is attacked on the right side, for example. It's the end of the phalanx, particularly when facing very dynamic Romans. And so we are told that as the phalanx is disrupted by the constant rhythmic showers of javelins from the legionaries, the formation opens and the Romans jump in. This is how the armies of the Hellenic world, which had already paid a hefty price against the shock and charge techniques of Celtic troops during the expedition of 279 BC, collapses. And the brutal pressure of Roman legions, supported by professional logistics, becomes conclusive. 
Military speaking, stagnation and a comparative limited implementation of new technology in comparison will be among the weak spots of Greek warfare that will be exploited by the Romans. Environmental factors, access to global resources, diffusion of innovation, inner political fragmentation, economic imbalances, all of these also contributed to the ultimate Roman domination of Greece. All right, noble ones, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please remember thumbs up. And if you're not yet members of this community, become a noble one. Subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings.